I had a very rare congenital heart condition called arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And it was a progressive disease. So I was told as a you know very fit athletic young woman that what I couldn't do any longer was train and be athletic. Welcome to Flip Your Script, the podcast about life's critical turning points and how people find the inspiration and motivation to move forward and rewrite their unique stories. Flip Your Script is produced by Media Minefield, a public relations firm passionate about the power of sharing stories. Specializing in earned and social media, Media Minefield helps clients take control of their unique story and message. The show is hosted by Christy Peel, founder and CEO of Media Minefield, who flipped her script from an Emmy-winning journalist to a successful entrepreneur and speaker. Christy Sidler was a physically fit woman on a bike ride when she had an episode that dramatically flipped her script and turned her life upside down. She learned she had a progressive heart disease. In March 2021, Christy had a heart transplant. Christy, welcome to the Flip Your Script podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Christy. I appreciate it. It's so fascinating to talk with someone who has had such an unusual, but not that unusual, I guess, wellness journey to the point where you were healthy, had the situation, and now you're on the totally other spectrum speaking about wellness. So let's go backwards to that bike ride. What happened on the bike ride? I had been training for a triathlon. I had been a very physically fit person, um, probably to the extent of being a little crazy doing 50 mile rollerblades from San Francisco to San Jose and hundred mile bike rides. None of that was enough. So I figured I had to go train for a triathlon and really backing up a few years. I was a fitness instructor and actually passed out in front of my class three years previous. So if you can imagine your fitness class, just watching the instructor go down. Um, So I was misdiagnosed with something related to my heart prior to this bike ride But they said as strangely and abruptly as it came on, it could just go away. So do what your body can handle. So apparently I thought my body could handle a lot until that day. So I was living in the Bay Area in California and was cresting a hill on a bike ride to the gym to swim as I was leading up to this triathlon. And I felt my heart go into this abnormal rhythm. And I knew it had happened before, so I wasn't panicked. But this was 1999 when people didn't commonly carry a cell phone. I was by myself. It was my 31st birthday. And I sat on my bike for a bit, just assuming my body would convert out of this rhythm. And about 15 minutes later, I couldn't even sit on my bike anymore. I was getting too lightheaded. So I sat on the side of the street. And then the same thing I just was getting, I was really starting to feel you know, like I wasn't going to be able to remain conscious. So I laid down and I was literally in and out of consciousness, just thinking, this is where I'm going to spend my last birthday on the side of the road dead. And fortunately, about 40 minutes later, another cyclist rode by, he happened to have a cell phone called the paramedics, paramedics came and used the shock paddles, which we've all probably seen in movies that they put the defibrillator pads on. And the paramedic said to me, I'm sorry, this is going to hurt. Because again, if you think about seeing that in movies, people are dead typically when they're using the shock pedals. Well, I was well alert and alive, but he obviously gave me so much Valium. I, first of all, never really felt anything. And second of all, I was obviously so drugged up. I said to him, great, can I ride my bike home now? (laughs) And he said, yeah, no, we're going to the hospital. But I found out later that my heart rate was at 280 beats a minute. It was exceptionally out of control. Um, So obviously I felt great being back to normal, went to the hospital and it took them 10 days to figure out what was wrong with me. I have had, I guess I can say had now because I have a new heart. Um, I had a very rare congenital heart condition called arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And it was a progressive disease. So I was told as a very fit athletic young woman that what I couldn't do any longer was train and be athletic because the disease I have has progressed with intense exercise. So I was told I could walk. I was told I could do some basic bike riding on the flats, but getting a defibrillator inserted into me, being told I had this diagnosis, none of that was as devastating to me as being told at the time that I couldn't train. That was part of your identity. It was who you were. 100%. Yep. So You had no idea when you were laying there on the road that this was something that could be 
fixed. I mean, you didn't know how serious it was because it came out of nowhere, even though you had an episode before, but you didn't know what you were dealing with. Exactly. Yeah. No, I thought it was something very simple. And so, yes, at the time, and as I was, once I was diagnosed and found out that many people who have the disease that I had, their first sign or symptom is sudden death. So because I was so healthy, the arrhythmia that I had essentially, instead of having your blood pump in through the atrium and out through the ventricle in, out, in, out in a very rhythmic fashion, my, basically my ventricle just take, takes over and whatever tiny little bit of blood can drip in, in those 280 beats a minute is what was keeping me alive. And again, I was healthy enough that I was able to sustain living. So how did you get mentally past the spot where they said you can't exercise, you can't do the thing that you love to do anymore? How did you deal with that? Well, let me tell you how I didn't deal with that. I was good for probably a few months, tried to walk, not run, did a little bit more running than I should have a couple times passed out again, but I now had a defibrillator inside my body. So if I went into this rhythm again, it shocked me internally. Fortunately, because my heart rate was so fast, I would usually pass out. So I didn't feel the shock. Um, Since then, I had had several shocks where it feels like a horse kicking you in the chest. So it was nice to be passed out, frankly. But after a couple of times of that happening, I was at the gym and I was on the treadmill and I was a very competitive young woman. And there was a woman next to me on the next treadmill. She was probably... 10, 15 years older than me. And I just was not going to have the fact that her speed on her treadmill was higher than mine. So I kept bumping mine up and bumping mine up. And I went into this arrhythmia again, and I passed out. I flew off the back of the treadmill into the mirror at the gym. And that's when I said, all right, it's time to listen to the docs. And I now will be doing yoga. I will be walking. I will be keeping things chill. And, you know, that's part, that was probably one of the first whip my script moments I had, which was my health, my longevity are dependent on me not doing the things that I love to do before, because this, this will kill me sooner, or this will get me to having to have a heart transplant sooner. So it was a really strong, powerful, healthy moment for me. When I realized I can still live a very fulfilling life, not doing the things I did before, just doing them a little little bit different way. And maybe with a little less exertion. Why do we as women do this weird, competitive, over the top sort of thing? It's like you're competing with a stranger and yet you're practically killing yourself. Literally. Literally. And that's not judgment. That's like been there. I've I've been next to the older woman or person that isn't, I don't think should be able to run faster than being like, oh yeah, watch this. Like, what am I, what what am I trying to prove? Yeah. It's an interesting obviously study in psychology, um, that I was really very able to get over. And I, I, you know, I did live many, many more years with this condition that progressed very slowly because of the fact that I finally realized that I needed to take care of myself. I needed to listen to my doctors. I needed to let some of those competitive natures just go to the wayside. And it was the best thing for me hard, but it was a good thing for me. So over 20 years, then you get to the point where it's progressed and you need to have a heart transplant. Did you know that that was a conversation the doctors were going to have at that appointment? Did you suspect it? Or was it like, really? Oh, I thought we were going to avoid this for longer. Yeah, this is where you're going to probably also think I'm a little crazy. So because I, it was frustrating to not have a heart that worked properly. And for Probably seven, eight, nine years, every annual appointment with my cardiologist, I would say, can I get a new heart yet? And he's like, Christy, you don't get a new heart until you need a new heart and you don't need a new heart. I'm like, but I want a new heart. So it became a joke, a running joke for a while. But I I lived overseas in Asia for several years and I was there from 2015 to 2018. And about the early part of 2017, I would notice when I would travel, because I was traveling all over the region, being on long plane flights, and I would get off the flight and my my legs and my feet would be very swollen. So that was a sign that edema, they call it, was a sign of heart failure. So I knew in about 2017, I was starting to go into more serious heart failure. I got to a point a little bit later where 
not only was I being, I was seeing swelling in my legs and my extremities, but then I would be walking and I would feel this almost like I had a football in my gut. And I found out later from another cardiologist who was treating me for advanced heart failure, who said, when your body can't pump blood enough to get the fluids moving in your body and they are going to pull at your legs, the next places they're going to pull in your abdomen. So I, you know, I know you can't see me, but I've always been a very thin person. I've always, you know, sad to say it, I've been very proud of my flat stomach. And it was very hard for me to accept that I now had this bulge in my stomach, which was this additional fluid pooling in the center of my body. So to answer your question, this was starting to be quite progressive. And in 2020, that's when we really started to get serious about looking at heart transplant as an option. And in order to get a heart transplant, there is a multi-stage workup where they need to make sure that everything else about you is healthy enough because they don't want to give an organ to somebody who could die of something else. So from dentist appointments to colonoscopies, to mammograms, to bone density tests, to, I mean, every kind of blood work you could imagine, we went through to check the viability of my body to accept a new heart. So we got to the point where it was the end of last year, the, the heart transplant team looked at my case and there had been probably three people on the team of 18 who had seen me face to face and looked me in the eyes. And I didn't look unhealthy. I, I look at myself now that I've had a new heart and I look very healthy compared to where I was, but you would never, ever, ever have looked at me and thought I was a heart patient. So those few people who had seen me, you know, knew a little bit more about my functionality and my ability to, to get through life. But everybody else who was on that team who hadn't seen me and opened up my chart after all of my studies had been done, unanimously said, get this woman on the heart transplant. And one of the doctors even said, I don't know how she can walk down the hall. Her heart is so enlarged that I don't know how she can function. So I knew my heart was getting enlarged, but I never knew it was that bad. And I actually never really knew until after my transplant, when I saw the side-by-side x-rays of what it looked like before, but that was the point when we realized it's now, it's now time. So I had wanted it. I was going through the process of getting it. There was some trepidation, of course. I'm not going to say that I was a superwoman. It was like, yes, this is the greatest thing ever, but honestly, it really, it really was the greatest thing ever. And my biggest worry was worrying about everybody else. I I feared more than anything being in surgery for 10 to 14 hours while the rest of my family was worried about me. I I had the best confidence and faith in my team and the heart transplant surgeons. I can honestly tell you, I went into that surgery with zero nervousness or anxiety because I knew I was gonna come out on the other end in a much, much better place, but I was worried about everybody else. And that's what I wasn't looking forward to. Because you got to see their faces as they wheeled you off looking afraid and scared and perhaps saying goodbyes because you just never know. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it was interesting. I went through this internal battle of, do I write like thank you notes to all of the people I love in case I don't make it on the other side? I want to make sure that they know I loved them and how much of an impact they made on me. And, you know, A, I'm a very expressive person. So I, you know, I, I didn't feel like if I, if I were to die on the operating table that they wouldn't know that. But again, I had so much confidence that to me, that was almost a waste of emotion and energy because I knew I was going to come out the other side. And I, and I, again, I have no problem expressing my feelings to my family and my close friends. And so I didn't do that. And I think about that a lot, you know, what made me decide not to have that exercise of really saying potentially goodbye to my family members, but I guess I just had so much faith and confidence. Um, but that was a big piece of it is like, what, you know, well, what if, but you know, and I don't want to go down the what if I'm not a worrier by nature. And because I just, again, I had so much confidence in my team. I was just ready to get to the other side. And my husband was amazing keeping everybody updated during the, my surgery actually was only six and a half hours. It's typically eight to 14. Cause you're a superwoman, And if it takes someone else, 10 hours, it's taken me six. That's right. And you know, you're usually in the hospital for 10 to 14 days and I was out in seven or eight or whatever it was, but he was fantastic about keeping everybody up to date. And the team was really great about keeping him up to date. So in hindsight, it was great, but that was definitely a worry for me, but I was mentally, I was so excited and so ready. And when I finally got the call, 
um, which was another crazy story. I just, I was going to get on the list and could have been waiting for months or years like most people do. But I had one bad weekend where my, um, my arrhythmia was really pronounced. I went into the hospital on Monday morning. They admitted me into ICU Monday night. Tuesday, I was on the list. Wednesday, a heart became available and Thursday it was in my chest. That does not happen to typical transplant patients. You know, I, I think that's probably the other thing that I worried about was, ah, it's going to really stink when I get on that list. And every morning I have to wake up and think, did I tell everybody I love them? Did I shave today? Did I get my documentation to my systems at work? Like all of those things. And I, I was really fortunate that it went so quickly for me that I got the call on a Wednesday night. I was literally cheering. And then 630 in the morning on Thursday, I was in the operating room. I've read and, and talked with some people who have received transplants, and I understand that it's a very strange experience because your best day comes only because, likely, of someone else's worst day. And that is, to some degree, a blessing, but it's a burden. And it's a really odd emotion because there's nothing else in life that is that same experience. How did you navigate that? Yeah. So I, I actually had to navigate that twice. The first was, you know, obviously after my surgery and I had the opportunity to send a letter to the family of the donor and it goes through a coordinator. So I don't know who it is. And at that moment, I didn't know the age, the sex, the circumstances, the location, any of that. So it was probably two weeks after my surgery, I, I'd been home a week or so and I mean, really, other than writing my wedding vows and writing what I haven't had to do yet, which is my parents' eulogy, this was the most meaningful thing I've ever written in my life. And it was such a juxtaposition of gratitude and sorrow and empathy. And it was, you're right. I mean, there's no way for me to express what writing that letter meant. It means a lot to me that I was able to put what I think were the best ways to express myself into writing and get it to the family. And I do know that the family accepted my letter because the, the donor organization would have told me that they rejected it. So once the donor family gets the letter, it is up to them if they choose to acknowledge it, ask me questions, tell me things about their family member, ask to meet me. And none of that has happened yet. And I, I'm not surprised. I mean, especially, you know, I try to put myself in their shoes of receiving a letter possibly two weeks after my son or daughter has died. And it's just probably not the right time, but it was important for me to know, let them know how, how much it meant to me that their family member sacrificed that for me. Fast forward, I had been told that I was allowed to find out the sex and the age, if the family didn't contact me, the sex and the age in the state of Michigan where I live, um, one year after surgery. And I got wind from a Facebook transplant group that I just joined recently that I might be able to find that out just by calling the donor organization. So I did that last week. Um, and I found out that this heart was donated from a 37 year old woman. I don't know from where, but that's when it became, it, it moved from being something mechanical to something very, very personal. I'm getting a little choked up, but it was very hard for me to realize that that came from an actual human who has saved my life. Would you like to meet her loved ones? I go back and forth about that. If they want to meet me, I absolutely would meet them. I don't have as much of a burning desire to be proactive about that. But yeah, if they wanted to, there is nothing in the world that would stop me from letting them see what has happened to their child's organ and in particular a heart, which is so, it's just, it's just such a, a meaningful central part of a person's life that, yeah, if they wanted to do that, I absolutely would. But you're not Googling 37 year old woman accident mission. I mean, you're not like really looking for this person, but you'd be willing if they reached out to you. 100% I would. Yes. Has anything changed about besides the health factor? Like, do you have any connection to the, I mean, I'm sure people ask you that all the time because it's, it's so interesting that something that was in someone else saved your life and will make you have life. It's something so few people get to experience and are willing to talk about. Yeah. I truly wake up every morning and I put my hand on my chest and I'm just, I'm, I thank the, the donor family. I'm so grateful because I mean, for so many reasons, but I think about 
near the end, how difficult just getting through life was for me. I mean, I, you know, things like walking upstairs or I would, I would walk in my neighborhood and if it was like a two degree incline in the street, I would have to stop. I mean, you know, I, again, I look very, very healthy. You would never know otherwise, but it was those little things that became so frustrating for somebody like me who was so healthy and so fit. So, you know, I think the first piece of it is just that sheer gratitude that I, I truly have a second chance at life. You know, we've dubbed me Christy 2.0. So those kinds of things, they're so meaningful. I think, you know, I, I didn't I honestly didn't do a lot of research prior to my surgery about what it what happens during a transplant and what does this mean and what what changes in my body. I just kind of wanted to go through it and let it happen. But there have been you know a lot of questions, studies about does the does the recipient take on the personality traits of their donor? Does do the memories transfer over? Do you all of a sudden like you know, doing origami because the person who was, you know, who had the heart before did origami. Um, I haven't noticed any of those things. I'm a spiritual person in the sense of gratitude and, and faith and believing that things happen for a reason. But I don't, I don't think the concept of having somebody's soul come into my body is something that, that is happening to me. Other people may feel differently. So to me, it's a bit more of a, it's an organ that, that I absolutely needed. And I, I can't be more grateful for having, but again, I will say my, my, my script was flipped a little bit when I found out that this came from an actual 37 year old woman. And not that I didn't know it came from a real person, but when those parameters were presented to me, it did, it did become a little bit more human and I, you know, this sort of desire to want to celebrate her but no, as far as any personality traits or things that I think I've picked up, I did, I did ask my doctor if my DNA has changed and it has not other than, you know, other than the actual tissue within my heart, but I am still the same person with the same DNA with this additional wonderful organ that is now a new part of me. And if you're listening and you're not sure about being a donor, may <laughs> this serve as inspiration to change your donor status to become a donor. Yes. Absolutely. And it, you know, it's interesting. I, I thought I had, um, and I panicked, I got home from the hospital and the first thing I did was grab my ID to make sure that I truly had been a donor all this time. And I, and I am, and I have a, you know, a donor flag on my car and we, you know, my husband's license plate says, you know, the gift of life. And I mean, all of these things that now we, we truly are advocates obviously for this process and it's so meaningful. And that process has turned your career to some degree in that you're now pretty involved in talking about wellness and thinking about wellness and encouraging other people to think about wellness. So share some of that journey as well, because had this never happened to you in the 90s and then the transplant, you may not be thinking about wellness the way that you're thinking about wellness. Yeah, you are so right. When I had my incident in 99 in 2000, immediately called the heart association and said, I would like to be involved. What can I do? And I, I started a heart walk team in 2000 in the Bay area. I moved to Michigan a couple of years after that and have been involved in the heart association ever since from speaking engagements, doing videos, working in some of their big campaigns. Um, I've been on the board for several years. I'm currently the chair of the board for the Southeast Michigan heart association so that is, you know, certainly a way that I've seen being able to impact other people. Nothing has made me happier than to be at a speaking engagement, whether it's at a corporation or at one of the large events. And someone comes up to me afterwards and says, you know, I had this little feeling in my heart and do you think I should do something about it? And I, I tell them the story about when I was first misdiagnosed, um, that first six months after I passed out in front of my fitness class, I was told you probably didn't eat enough. You probably didn't drink enough. Oh, it's just that time of the month. You're probably having some weird arrhythmias. And, and I was just exceptionally advocating for my health, for my body and really pushing my doctors. And so that was always my platform with the Heart Association is listen to your body, you know, particularly women, we have incredible sixth senses. 
do advocate for yourself, do push your doctors. Uh, and I'm, you know, there are a lot of incredible medical professionals out there, but sometimes things are missed. And if you feel like you're not getting the attention that you need, you need to press for that. So that was always very gratifying for me when I would then get that call two weeks later from the person I talked to in that little sidebar conversation after the event to say, you know what, I went to the doctor and something was wrong. And I'm really appreciative that you pushed me to that point of being able to do that. So I like to know that I was able to impact people over the course of that time with the Heart Association. But I've taken another, another turn um, where I'm, I'm actually in the process of writing a book. And I've always dabbled with the idea of writing. Um, I just, I've had so many crazy experiences throughout this 20 year journey with my heart. And then what really, what really changed things when it really pushed me in that direction was when I got home from the hospital, I thought, you know, here I am coming home to two caretakers, my wonderful mom, my wonderful husband. I had amazing medical care at the Henry Ford health system in Detroit. I am a disciplined person. I understand the basics of fitness and health and nutrition. I have the drive to put together a plan for myself to make sure I am taking my meds every day. I am taking my blood pressure as I'm supposed to. I'm checking my blood glucose because one of my medications could give me diabetes. Like all of these things that I was very keen to make sure I followed. And I thought, you know what? the guy to the right of me and the guy to the left of me in in the ICU after all of our transplants may very well not be going home to that same situation and may have a wife who's complaining that they're too much of a burden to them and may want to go back to smoking or may not realize that going to cardiac rehab is something you really need to do to get back on track. And it just made me realize that not everybody is in the position or has had the, the experiences or the discipline to come into a place where I am. So I started thinking about the many people who would say to me two, five, six, eight weeks after my surgery, you look incredible. Like you must've been really healthy going into this experience. And, and physically, yes, I was, but then I started thinking, you know, there are many dimensions of wellness that I really believe contributed to me being in a headspace, in a spiritual space, in a social space, that got me to really get through this. So that's when I chose to actually write a book that is part my memoir and my my story of going through this 20 years of my heart disease to taking what I learned and the second half of my book is focused on what I'm hopefully gonna be trademarking soon, what's called my wellness widget, which is six dimensions of wellness being physical, emotional, social, spiritual, financial and vocational. And if you can get all of those things working properly and we're never, none of us are perfect. We can't have all six of those working like a fine tuned, finely oiled machine. But my point and how I've lived my life in wanting to help others is if you read my book or look at some of the things that I've done in my life to feel more fulfilled, take one of those, take four of those and just make a difference in your life. And if I can help impact that, that is, I don't care if I make a dime off these books. I just want to be able to know that somebody read something that went, gosh, I never thought about it that way. And if I could do something differently, maybe someday I am going to have some traumatic incident and let me get ahead of it now. That means I've done what I'm put on this earth to do. And so each of those six areas, you mentioned it, but I want to reiterate it. You're never good. Like you can always get better. I mean, you, you can always get a little more healthy and you can always have a little bit more financial stability and you can always, so it's this ongoing lifelong evolution that continues. And as we go into different seasons of our life and our relationships, they look different, but I think there's this mindset of like check done. It's like, well, no, because each of those areas can always be moving forward or backward because like so many things in life, standing still means backwards because you are either growing or you're dying. There really isn't an in-between. So it's so much of wellness. People go to health or they go to weight or they go to clothes size. So I love that you're talking about these six things that are connected, but maybe not always in the same conversation. Yeah, I I completely agree with that. I do think a lot of people think of wellness as their fitness, their health, their nutrition, the number on the scale. 
And I'll tell you one of the things that if I look at my wellness widget and I think about my six dimensions, the one that I, I think I go to more than anything is within the emotional wellness segment and specifically in worrying. When I was putting my widget together, I did, you know, did a lot of research on what is, you know, what does one institute consider emotional wellness and what does another study consider social wellness? And I took a lot of that and just made it my own. And I, yeah, there was a lot of ability to manage stress and a lot of ability to interact well in, a, in scenarios with different you know, groups of people, types of settings. But I never really saw a lot on worrying. And I mean, obviously stress and worry go together, but that has been a big philosophy of mine is if it is out of my control, I can't spend the energy worrying about it. And that is so easy to say. I have many people in my life who are big worriers and I, you know, I try to help them understand that it's not productive. It's not comfortable, but you, some of these things that I, that I talk about, you can't switch somebody overnight, but the more I talk about it, the more I give examples of how I have been able to deal with it. I hope that some of those things will eventually take in their lives. And maybe if it's one or two scenarios that they can say, gosh, this month, I didn't worry about that. I still worried about seven other things, but I didn't worry about that. Um, then that means I've, I've done some good. I, I will say one of the other areas that was really important to me, and this, this was such a, a shift in my thinking during my, during my recovery. I was, I've always, you know, I mean, you can imagine based on the, the history I have from the fitness aspect, you know, I was always very big on my fitness, my weight, my body image. I had terrible, terrible issues and fights about my weight, my body image. I was anorexic in college. I was what they called exercise bulimic in my twenties and thirties. I would notice if I had any change in my physique. I mean, I could, I ate 10 chips today. It was too salty. My face is a little bit fatter. I mean, it was debilitating in some ways. I mean, I lived, got through life. I went through therapy. I'm much, much, much better than I was, but I will tell you that when I was going through the stage of my heart failure with this additional weight in my, in my gut and in my belly, um, I, you know, I did get to the point where I thought, you know, there's nothing I can do about it, but it really, really bothers me. And I couldn't quite get past it. Fast forward to coming back from my surgery when I was now on 32 pills a day, I'm down to 22, hooray, but I will be on many for the rest of my life. But one of the pills that I take, and it's much decreased from, it, from when it was five months ago, but is prednisone, which is a steroid. And one of the common effects of this particular steroid is what they call moon face, which is a very enlarged, you know, fatty looking face and fatty deposits in your belly. Other places as well, my knees was an, another area, the area around my armpits. And I hated it, but you know what? I It was the most prominent, significant part of my recovery to realize that I can't control it. It's not my body. This is not my typical body right now. There's nothing, I cannot wish away, I cannot, fast away. I cannot try to eat less to get, this is the way my body is going to be right now because of the medication. And of course, the other side of that is, and I'm alive. And it, it was, it was so liberating to me. And, you know, we, as women particularly have so many issues with our body image, our weight, you know, fat shaming, whatever you want to call it. And it was, it was the best thing for me to look at myself. I would never have done this pre-surgery, but I actually had my husband the day I got home from the hospital and every month thereafter, take a picture of me in a pair of shorts and a sports bra and mortifying as it was to look at this body that did not belong to me. It's been so gratifying to see how it's coming back to, to shape and what I know it can be in a year or two years but for me to be okay with it. Like I look at those pictures on my phone and I think that's me. I kind of look gross, but you know what? That's me alive and I'm cool with it. What a total sh shift of perspective. Absolutely. I, I hope that, that that's another thing that I, you know, I do want to be able to get as a part of an outcome of my book is to be able to impact more women where this is such a, such an issue. And I'm not saying I'm fixed. I'm not saying I don't still, I mean, I don't, I've never been much of a weigher, but I, I don't, can't say that I don't still go, ah, oh, this is awesome. I'm down to only two and a half milligrams of prednisone and I can tell the difference, but I don't think I'm going to go back to where I was. It's just not worth the energy.
And there's only so many things that you can have energy for. And so you have to choose carefully. I want to read the six things again in the wellness widget. Emotional, physical, spiritual, social, vocational, and financial. And I don't know that any of those things can live or do well on their own. So they're so connected. And I think often we try to take one and put it off to the side and work on the other thing. Or, well, I can exercise my way to weight health, not realizing that there's a complete connection to emotional health. And the wellness widget of a circle of all things that are interconnected, I think is a, it's a really interesting way to think about it. Yeah, I started doing some speaking engagements where I engage people in these sort of interactive, maybe interactive and introspective. I think it starts introspective where I position these questions to them. Think about a time when, and you know, how did that make you feel? Or if you hadn't done it that way, what if? And, you know, I think that's, that's where we come to at the end after everybody writes and then shares for those who are comfortable sharing. I often get exactly what you said, which is at the end, they realize if this is out of whack, then it's probably pretty likely that this is going to be out of whack as well. And, you know, again, we're not, we're not superhuman. We can't say we're going to work on all six things every day and they're all going to be perfect by the end of next month. Never. But you know, much like an athlete who says, the more I, the more I work out, the more I exercise, the more I see the transformation in my body and how good I feel, the less I want to eat the bag of chips or the less I want to go have that extra drink. And so they, they are interconnected, but you just start to realize that one healthy dimension begets another healthy dimension. And soon enough, again, we will never be perfect, but soon enough, you just start to see those things inter interconnected and really working in that you know, wheel and cog and spoke that we just feel, we feel better. And I think one of my other things I talk about is when you feel better, the people around you feel better about you and then they can start to feel better about themselves. So there's this sort of hidden pay it forward component of being healthy because it's not just you who is healthy. Nobody wants to be around a grumpy, unhealthy, complaining person. And when you all of a sudden become this person that's more confident more connected, more useful in these areas, people want to, they want that. They want to be with you and they want that for themselves. And each of those areas, there's a short-term benefit and a long-term benefit. And that's the, I think, mind-bending part about is that you started from a place of, I am going to have a long-term successful transplant slash life because I entered into this healthy and if I can ha- be emotionally healthy and spiritual healthy and, and I can be well, that's a, every day I feel better. Every day I feel better. And when the rubber hits the road and I really need to depend on this, I'm going to have a long-term benefit. It's much like financial. You put it away and that retirement is coming. But knowing it's coming, I feel better that it's, it's taken care of. And someday I'm going to have that big expense. I'm going to have that unexpected. But you can't wait until you're 65 to save for retirement. And if you d- don't think about it until you're 64, there's a lot of stress. So it's interesting how all of these wellness areas, there's short-term and long-term benefit. Yeah, that's really astute, Christy. I think part of when I was writing my book, I thought, in fact, I, I, I was going to call my book Preform to Transform. And really what you just said, which is get ahead of this stuff do the things before something traumatic would happen. We don't ever think something traumatic is going to happen. We don't expect it. We don't want it, but we're all going to have something right. That we're going to have to get through and it's better to obviously be healthy. And I still believe in that concept. I chose to title my book, my change of heart, um, lessons from a transplant patient and a fulfilling life. But I, I completely agree with what you're saying that there is this idea of, we can't wait we're going to be challenged at some point in our lives. And the more we can take head on that challenge with a healthier balance of these dimensions of wellness, the better we're going to get through it. So start now. It's a great way to end as we go to the the final question, which is, is there a song of uh, quote something that has helped motivate and inspire you as you've flipped your script actually several times. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. My dad and I, my dad and I are both really big into music, and we we both love you too. We always have. And he started when he was selling um, back in his forties, 
some really big deals, he would always put on the car where the streets have no name by YouTube. And as I got into my career, that became my pump up song. And really it was more about the music and the opening. And if you haven't heard the song, it's the greatest minute and 13 seconds of any song opening, I think in the history of my life anyway. Um, but then I got to really think about the lyrics and my husband and I, when we got married, you know, every couple walks into the reception and let me introduce you for the first time, Mr. And Mrs. David Siddler. And that opening minute and 13 seconds was our introduction song. And so I think about the, the music to me is very motivating. It's very personal because of my dad, but the concept of where the streets have no name, we don't know where we're going and there's so much to be experienced. And I just love that concept of something new, something different, something better can happen tomorrow. And so I sort of live my life on that, where the streets have no name concept and between the word and or the, the song and what the, the words mean. Um, it's something I'm sure I'll always live by. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you, Christy. This has been amazing. I really, really appreciate your time. We're going to put a link to the song on the Flip Your Script podcast website. We'll also make sure that on social media, when that book comes out, that we'll mention it and tell people about it so that more people can think about the wellness widget. When I think about Christy's story, a couple of things strike me, which is we talk about it quite a bit on this podcast, struggle happens. And if you can be well enough to take on the struggle and to be prepared for it, it will be less of a struggle. You'll learn more and you'll come out the other side side and say, I'm almost glad that happened because I'm better for it. And if you aren't a donor, listen to Christy's story, change your ID, become a donor, you could save a life. My hope is that Christy's story empowers you to believe you're capable of more than you think, to discover motivation, to uncover inspiration, and to find the strength to turn the page. Thank you for listening to Flip Your Script, hosted by Christy Peel and produced by Media Minefield. If you like our message, please be sure to give us a five-star rating, subscribe to the show, and share our episodes with your family and friends. Do you or someone you know have a story about flipping your script? We'd love to share it. Contact us on our website, flipyourscriptpodcast.com. To stay up to date on all things Flip Your Script, make sure to follow host Christy Peel on social media. You can also check out the website for pictures, resources mentioned in the show, and other great episodes.